There were many of the religious liberty organizations in the country that began to reach out to me and say, wait a minute, what happened to you isn't constitutionally right. You can't be terminated from a position because you, in your private religious experience, share your beliefs. No matter how unpopular or politically incorrect those beliefs might be, you have a right as an American to, to the freedom to assemble, the freedom of speech, the freedom to, of religion, and all the other things that the First Amendment you know, afford us. And I got all these people, but how do you pick one of these attorneys? I had no idea. I'm a physician, I kind of have a little, you know, <laughs> kind of try to stay away from attorneys as much as possible. Sorry if you're an attorney. Um, but God worked even that out. And, you know, I used, I, I was asked God for a sign and one of them in this case was whoever was fly to California to meet with me would be the group I'm supposed to go with. And everybody else was calling and emailing and calling and emailing. One group said, listen, they gave me a call and said, we will be there in the next few days to meet with you. And they took me right here to Glendale, right here to the Cheesecake Factory, somewhere right around here. And we sat and we talked. And these guys said, listen, what has been done to you cannot be allowed. And it was their passion for religious liberty. I want you to get this. Because sometimes we think that it's just Adventism. That the only real Christians are in our denomination. Jesus says, no, there are many I have of other foes that you don't know about. And if you read the spirit of prophecy carefully, Ellen White tells us that there are many that are in our ranks now that are going to fall out. But there are going to be others who are going to come in and fill the ranks. Where do you think they're going to come from? And I met some powerful non-Adventist Christians who believe God's word. As much as they understand of it, they believe it. And they're willing to fight for your right to worship freely. And these guys, that's what they pitched. They said, listen, if this is allowed to fly, somebody will be in their Sunday school class. They, two reasons they gave me, because I didn't want to deal with it. Let me, let me just be honest with you. People tried to, I was, I was made to be a villain in the beginning, and at the end people tried to make me a hero. I'm neither. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Best way to sum it up. But they said it's two things. They said, one, if this goes unchecked, someone will be in their Sunday school class and they'll be putting something up on the felt board in their Sunday school class and say something that is, goes against the you know, popular societal norm at the time. And it'll get on face, Facebook. I don't do that stuff, so I almost said face something else. But Facebook. Or it'll get on Instagram or wherever. And that person will lose, go to work Monday and lose their job. They said, if we don't stand up against this, the ability to come against Christians, Muslims, Jews, who, whatever religious belief they have will become much easier. I said, okay, that's a good argument. But he said another thing that really struck me. He said, you see, your denomination doesn't have bivocational pastors, meaning that on the weekend, they run their church. But during the week, he said, there are many pastors across the country that work in Starbucks. And I've met these pastors when I worked down south, guys that work cutting grass all week, and on Sunday, they run a church. He said, if this is allowed to happen to you, the days of the bivocational pastors in this country will be soon over. Because they'll simply have to hear what they say on Sunday, in their case, you know, they're speaking from their perspective. And if it doesn't fit right, they'll be able to take that to their employer on Monday and have that person fired. And I said, okay, sign me up.
to their own son, son in the church, Eric Walsh. It says, the Southern California Conference released a statement Tuesday distancing itself from the controversy surrounding past comments made by Pasadena Public Health Director and Seventh-day Adventist Associate Pastor Dr. Eric Walsh regarding homosexuals, Catholics, and Muslims. Southern California Conference spokeswoman Betty Cooney said, quote, Eric Walsh does not hold ministerial credentials from the Adventist Church. He does not speak on behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. And as far as we know, he does not represent his views as anything other than his own. Let's pause right there. Let's finish up. Her statement appeared to imply that Walsh's views on homosexuality did not reflect the church's views. Notice again, the spokeswoman for the Southern California Conference said, Look at this statement. This is from Adventist Vindicate, Ad Vindicate. The headline reads, The Southern California Conference distances itself from Eric Walsh. So this was the response from the Seventh-day Adventist Conference, the Southern California Conference, to be exact. This is a startling statement for the spokesperson of the conference of Seventh-day Adventists to say, yes, we know. Startling statement for the spokesperson of the conference of Seventh-day Adventists to say, yes, we know.
These are questions that we must pose to the Seventh-day Adventist leaders of our local churches, our local conferences, our union leaders at the constituency meetings. Ask, ask the NAD leaders, the other division leaders, are you going to do us as you did Eric Walsh? Now, friend, look at this picture right here. This is one of the lead spokesperson uh, lawyers for First Liberty. On his right hand, on our left, that's Eric Walsh in the corner right there. A picture says a thousand words. Eric Walsh is looking to the men of the world, the men of Babylon, to fight his case in the court of law to come to his rescue, to gain for him freedom, justice, judgment. But where is the Seventh-day Adventist lawyers? Where is the Religious Liberty Department of the North American Division at a time when one of its own bright stars needs their help, they have distanced themselves from their own. Here are the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Where are those pastor friends? Where are the GYC leaders?
are the leaders of the Seventh Day Adventist denomination? Where are those pastor friends? Where are the GYC leaders? The enemy comes after you like a flood, you begin to be, you question God, and the devil begins to plant doubt in your mind. And it doesn't matter how Christian you are, how well raised, and how much you know this truth, you begin to go through an agonizing period when you're being publicly ridiculed. I had jobs at USC, I was gonna teach, they instantly gone. I mean, I, I could go through it. Faculty positions even at Loma Linda, gone. Just like that. And I was left in a position where I was almost unemployed, except I'm Jamaican, so I always have three jobs, right? <laughs> so I was able to work the urgent care in Pasadena, and I was still on staff at Altadena, so I was able to work for a little while, but I knew I had to figure out what I was really gonna do because neither one of those was gonna really cut it. And over the next several months, and I'll talk about how God lifts me out of this in a minute, but, but I do want to stay, at the fa stay here for a second, that all of a sudden, people who were your friends, family, loved ones, bolt you'd be amazed at how people will pack up and run. I mean, they might hide and try and show you some support, but you'd be amazed at how people will run when the ridicule begins to fall. And people will show their true colors all of a sudden. And you start to see where people really think about you. Because when you had prestige and you had position and you had power and you were, you were sought after, that multiplied a mass of followers and friends. But when ridicule comes, people run for the hills. People don't want to be a part of that. Not in this day and age. So I was left in a very lonely, desolate place. And I tell you, it was very difficult to deal with because it affected a lot. Like I said, a life's work. You know, I was worried about my kids, what, you know, what they would go through through this whole process. And I began to just, at some point in there, I had to just lay on my face. There were two or three days when I couldn't even move. I didn't even leave the bed. I just laid on my face and I just agonized with God, like, why? Why are you allowing this to happen? And you start to ask yourself, why preach a gospel? Why be a part of preaching this word if this is the reward that preaching the word gives you? You start saying, Lord, I didn't sign up for this. Lord, stay with me. I gotta, you got to follow me through this. The, the, God, God has to lead me somewhere. And God begins to show you, well, you know what? You elevated your job too high. You're a little too much in love with what that job did for you. God then begins to show you through the process. I, talked to you, I told you about the fire this morning and how the fire begins to burn off the things that bind you. God began to show that your, your priorities were in this world more than you realized. And you thought that this world somehow actually liked you. Well, I'm showing you what the world actually thought of you. What they think of me, God is saying more importantly. Well, I was in that dark place. And let me tell you something. Some of you were praying for me. In fact, I think at this conference, which was timed perfectly in 2014, you guys prayed for me. And as people prayed for me around the world, as the story began to circulate, I'm telling you, I, could, I was laying on my face and I could feel the weight of the situation lift off of me. I began to come out of the initial shock, the shock. There's shock that comes in waves when you go through stuff like this. But that initial shock began to lift. And as I was, you know, trying to figure things out, um, there was a lot that happened. And I mean, you know, the, the media just kept pouring it on. I mean, it was weeks worth of stuff. And, you know, and it went all around the globe. And 
I started to ask God for help. And interestingly, that year in January of 2014, I had online applied for a position with the Georgia, state of Georgia, Department of Public Health. And I was given two interviews that I did by FaceTime and did very well. In fact, I now know what they scored me on on every stage of the interviews, and I scored head and shoulders above any other candidate. And in fact, you know, in their notes, they even say, listen, we'll never get a candidate like this again. We need to make sure we get him. We need a budget to bring him here, no matter, almost no matter what it would cost us. Ironically, the Monday or the Tuesday after the stories hit, like that next week or the week after, within a week and a half, I had a face-to-face -face interview with them in Georgia, the final interview for the job. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, God worked this whole thing out. This madness is happening in California. Georgia's the deep south. I'll probably be okay down there. And, you know, I, so I went to the interview, did very well again. I was not only offered the position, when they offered me the, the starting salary, I said, no, I want more money. And they actually gave me the more money I asked for. But in the newspaper here, this is where the story really gets to start to burn, it was released that one of the activists here in town said, we will follow him wherever he goes. We have friends in Georgia. Because of course the media was so obsessed with me at this point that I got a job and they put that in the LA Times and in the past in the Star News. And this activist said, we're gonna trace him down and basically, not so many words, we're gonna trace him down, we'll destroy him no matter where he goes. And he was successful. There was a campaign against me in the local media in Atlanta. I had friends of mine in Atlanta sending me screenshots of their TVs of me on the nightly news in Atlanta. Controversial hire, the caption says. And of course, within a few days, I get a, I was flying to New York to speak for a federation or something, and I get off of the plane and there's a voice message from Atlanta and I listened to the voice message there basically telling me, you know what, we, we've looked into you, and looked into your whatever, and we're not gonna be able to offer you the position. They thought they hung up the phone, but they didn't hang up the phone. And they begin to laugh and snicker and jeer. And you can hear it on the First Liberty website if you wanna actually hear the voicemail. And for the first time, as I sat on the plane, coming back, because I think I was getting on the plane coming back home, I, I broke down, I wept. I mean, I was like, man, God, this, is nothing going to work? I had gone to Oakwood like a week before and spoken to the faculty there and told them, oh, God is gonna work it out. I, I think I'm gonna get this job in Georgia. And the president of Oakwood University, a good friend of mine, Dr. Leslie Pollard said, Dr. Eric, it's not over yet. You don't know what else is gonna happen. And he, he, was, he was right. <laughs> it wasn't over. It, in fact, it was just beginning. And from that point, I was done. I mean, I got back to California, and that next Sabbath, I was at my friend Derek Rose's house, one of my best friends from Oakwood, from my freshman year there. And I thank God for Christian education and for the experience I had at Oakwood University, because my friends and the experiences I had there definitely helped pull me through all of this. My friend Derek Rose's house, one of my best friends from Oakwood, from my freshman year there. And I thank God for Christian education and for the experience I had at Oakwood University, because my friends and the experiences I had there definitely helped pull me through all of this. And he turned to me as my daughter was sitting next to me and he said, um, so what are you gonna do? And I said, you know, I don't know what I'm gonna do now because I thought I had a job. <laughs> and he said, and he, and he was like, yeah, well, what are you gonna do? And I said, you know, I said, I've always wanted to be a missionary in Guam. And he said, really? I said, yeah, when I was, at, when I was the director of the urgent care at Loma Linda, I talked to a doctor there, finds out later on it was Dr. Robinson. I talked to a doctor there that was trying to recruit me to come work in Guam. And, you know, I always wanted to, but of course I was too busy here because of my jobs here. Jobs, plural, jobs here. And I said, now I can go. And, you know, my daughter's like, oh, I'll never live in Guam, blah, 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 blah. Within 30 minutes, church, I got an email from the recruiter for the Guam Seven Day Adventist Clinic saying, Dr. Walsh, we want you to come and work in Guam. Within 30 minutes. 
I'd met many of them because I'd spoke for their, their, their version of GYC in Palau the summer before. So I knew a few of the people from the clinic I had met there. And I told my friend, I said, well, God, has answered, as we are sitting here, God has answered your question. And it didn't take more than, you know, like I was able to get a medical license there and everything. And, you know, later that summer I was there and I went to Guam alone and Guam was an amazing experience, but it was my, it was my, my um, wilderness experience in a sense, but it was also when Joseph was in prison, not that Guam was a prison, but <laughs> it's about 38 mi 32 miles long by eight miles wide and a third of the island or a quarter of the island to a third of the island is owned and run by the military, the US military, so there's not a whole lot of real estate as you can imagine. But that was my experience. During that time, I studied Joseph in depth, the story of Joseph, because Joseph, and I don't think I was a righteous man like Job or Joseph. God showed me that in the process. But Joseph, he, the way he handled himself in prison became an example as to how I should deal with my time trapped outside of being able to do the things I wanted to do and being in Guam. And what Joseph did that was most astounding in prison when you read it and you read the spirit of prophecy is Joseph became a servant in prison. The spirit of prophecy tells us that he looked after the well-being of the other inmates almost to a point where he was looking after them more than he looked after himself. And this is how he came in contact with the butler and the baker, if you remember the story. But God's is deep because in the story, there is this rule of two years if you study the story of Joseph. Joseph, after he tells the butler what he needs to tell him and the butler goes back to Pharaoh to work for Pharaoh, remember what Joseph says to him? Don't forget me. Tell the Pharaoh about me because I'm innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. Get me out of here. If you read the Bible carefully, and that's why you got to read the scripture over and over and over sometimes. If you read it carefully in there, it says it was two years that Joseph sat in prison waiting, waiting for Pharaoh to call him and to be liberated. The, the miracle happened two years before the fruit of the miracle surfaced. Revelation says, here is the what? The patience of the saints. And we often think of the patience in a lot of different ways. One of the direct, literal ways to look at that text is, we must learn to be patient and wait on God. You've got to wait on God. Because it won't just happen quickly or magically. God allows you to spend some time in the prison. He allows you to spend some time in the fire. Because there are things about your character he wants to cleanse and purify, as we talked about this morning. There are things God is trying to do with you so that you will be a better servant of his in the end. And he allows you sometimes to marinate in an uncomfortable situation in a painful situation. After almost a year in Guam, God told me it was time to come back. And I said, well, Lord, where am I gonna go? What I didn't know while I was in Guam, and Guam was very nice quiet, actually. It was plenty of good snorkeling and swimming and hiking and food and great churches. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed my time. That there would be such a shortage of physicians because of what Obamacare had done. So when I went online and put my name in, looking for a job on these search engines, be honest with you, I was overwhelmed with the response. I mean, everybody all over the country is looking for doctors like me. Family, I have a family medicine residency I did, and I did a preventive medicine, public health residency. The job, the job you know, opportunities just were astronomical. I couldn't even believe it. So I came back and one of the jobs I took because of some of my friends at the Mount Rubido Seven Adventist Church, two of them were on the board of Health to Hope, which is a homeless clinic in Riverside, a Christian 
homeless clinic in Riverside. It does amazing work. Um, and I came back as their chief medical officer half time. And then I started with a locum tenums group and I began to do locum tenums work, something I'd never done in my medical career. And I began to go up to Bakersfield and work. Um, and the pay was really good and you know, God was work I could see God was working some things out, that he was figuring some things out. A picture says a thousand words. 